All right, we're live. How you doing, bro? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. Um, life's been good. Uh, everything's good at work. Uh, we're finished with the, my documentary uh, that I've been doing with James Forney and Octane Rich Media here in Chicago. Uh, so my documentary is a redemption story based on my uh, life events and stuff. Uh, uh, mostly, you know, mine started off at uh, with me joining the gang here in Cicero, 12th Street Players. Uh, then everything kind of like escalated, started getting involved with drugs and uh, gang shootings. I ended up getting shot myself um, 11 times total on four occasions. Two of those times I was shot in my head. Um, I went down on three prison sentences. Uh, I got my federal number, you know, in the fed system for a perjury charge. This was probably back in uh, 2005. So that's my uncle Butch. Um, oh, that's not even you. <laughs> it looks just like you, bro. <laughs> yeah, that's Damn. that's my uncle. That's my uh, grandfather's brother. And my oh, uncle, shit. like I said, you know, growing up in Cicero, most of the people, you know, they're, you know, have fam family members or, you know, or they know somebody that their family's in the outfit in Chicago. Uh, oh, and he was. My uncle actually worked. Yeah, well, he was. He, he never admitted anything to me. So what it was, was my uncle knew certain people. He worked for, for a notorious uh, Cicero outfit heavy named uh, uh, James Marcello. So he was the doorman there and he worked the clubs for the boys. You know, that's what he mm -hmm. called them. And, uh, you know, so like growing up in Cicero, there's a lot of outfit guys, a lot of Italians, you know, you got different ethnicities in Cicero. But, you know, it's a different kind of uh, lifestyle, you know, growing up in Cicero, back when I was growing up. So, you know, the outfit had a strong influence. And you might not personally know them, but you would see certain guys. And, you know, that's kind of what drove me. You know, I, I used to be enticed by, like, anything that was uh, mafia, gang, you know. It just it, it excited me. And that's what drew me towards it. And... My uncle, you know, a few of my uncles actually were people that, you know, kind of influenced me, you know, not into the like bad lifestyle, but hey, there we are. Hey, James, there he is. How you doing, man? Nice to meet you, man. My name's Adrian. <laughs> He's just going into a story. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's a redemption story and I've been, been through quite a few things. I'm lucky that you know nowadays uh hey guys things have worked out hey, hey what's happening james can you hear us james can you hear us can you hear us james ah oh, yeah now i got you yeah. there you go okay <laughs> and you guys can hear me okay, okay good yeah we can hear you perfect man perfect. Yes, sir. <laughs> nice my, to meet uh, you man my dog's like who are you talking about there she's barking <laughs> up a storm <laughs> hey, think someone's in there yeah. <laughs> But uh, well, so you keep on going on, Steve. Steve, you were talking about uh, you know, just your early life. You know, what I mean, um, uh, you know, getting into all this. Yeah. Stuff. So I, I mean, was just. You... <clears throat> well, as a kid growing up, you know, I was just influenced by you know a lot of bad things, and that was you know what I was drawn to, you know, and uh, that's what excited me. And then you know, eventually, I joined the gang and got involved with bad things. Ended up going to prison, and then when I was in prison, you know, I started making connections and meeting people. And, uh, you know, I kind of, you know, I, I just kind of moved up and, you know, luckily for me though, you know, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, uh, my wife got pregnant, uh, with our first son who's autistic. So that was a big, you know, game stopper for me, which was good, you know, because it, it, it got me settled down and, uh, got me in the right direction. It motivated me and stuff. And, uh, right. you know, I've been out 10 years now. I haven't, I have. Oh, he muted. Oh, you, hey, Steve, you hit, you hit mute on there, Steve. <laughs> you hit the mute button, Steve. Here he goes. <laughs> He's back now. We can hear you. So, you know, luckily I had a good support system. So when I got out, you know, uh, I got settled down. I got myself in a good job. I'm a Teamster 703. 
Uh, so I got established, you know, and just from there, everything kind of just took off, you know, and it's been great the last 11 years and things keep getting better. You know, like I One, said, probably two years ago. I, I was going to say, and- yeah, yeah. And, you know, before we skip over something, I mean, this part was, you know, pretty important too, was, you know, when you had gotten shot, you know, I think this is when, I don't know what time this was, but you were shot on three <laughs> multiple occasions or something. And four, you've been shot four. a lot of times. Four. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I was shot on four different occasions. So this is a picture when um, I got into a car wreck mm-hmm. and I had a, it was pretty bad. It was, you know, life changer for me. I had dislocated my leg and came, tore it on a socket. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tore my aortic valve. I had multiple broken bones. So I had barely survived that, you know. So that was just another thing to my list of, you know, a bunch of things that had happened that I was able to overcome, you know, and yeah. that probably happened about eight. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't supposed to walk out of that car uh, alive, but luckily, you know, I was actually out of the hospital after about two months. I was on ICU. I had to have a stint put in my heart because uh, I had tore the aortic valve uh, with the steering wheel from the impact. So it was hanging by a piece of, by a piece of fat. And uh, luckily, you know, I was able to get it repaired. And, you know, luckily they found it in time, too, because they didn't know what was happening at first. And then they, whatever test they did, they discovered that I had tore the aortic valve, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, I'm doing good now. <laughs> Since, you know? Yeah, you got Physically. the documentary and everything. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. if you want, I'll yeah. play the trailer for it right now. And, uh, you know, people can, you know, get a, you know, a feel for it. So now they... Cause you've been on my channel before. I mean, so that's why, you know, I just said yeah. a little brief background and stuff, but yeah, we'll go ahead and play it and, uh, you know, give the people, we'll play it a few times throughout here. Okay. Play from the beginning. When I got involved, it was around uh, 1992, 1993. Kicking, punching, hitting, anything goes. That was how you got into our gang back then. That's the farm league for the Chicago outfit. I'd be doing most of the work in Cicero. I was a shooter. I was involved with uh, PCP crack, heroin. Some people are known to survive through gunshots uh, through the heightened state of PCP. My nickname is Stevie Bullets. I just remember the burning and I remember in the ambulance looking out the back of the window and just thinking like that was probably going to be it for me. Usually you don't cooperate with the police. What happens in the street stays in the streets. Two thousand and six. I just got released from Vandalia Prison and I went straight to the bar. I just was going there for a Halloween party, straight from prison, right off the prison bus. They had an outfit waiting for me in the parking lot. It was a Miami Vice cop. And I was in pink and white. And I met Steve that night. He was a very pasty white vampire. <laughs> he was okay. I didn't really think he was my Hype at the time. But I mean, he was very nice. We were talking for a little bit and then he disappeared. And I'm like, okay, where'd you go? <laughs> Come to find out he had to be home at midnight because he just got off the bus from prison. And I had no idea. Well, Lucia's family was in law enforcement, so I didn't mix too well at first. He was a bad boy. And I wasn't supposed to be with a bad boy. I knew like right away that that's who I wanted to be with. I mean, he told me he loved me within a week. Told me he was gonna be with me for the rest of his life. About a month later, we were inseparable. I mean, we had our moments. He He's like a volcano, I'm like an earthquake, and we go at it, but we were always together. And then I ended up catching a serious time and felony, and I ended up getting six year sentence. There was no conversation, he was gone. I thought our relationship was over. Until I started receiving all the letters I just pursued her from jail. I pretty much started writing her one, two times a day, every single day for two 
two and a half years. Please stick out this sentence with me. I love you, I want to be with you. And he wrote me every day for a year. I felt loved. You have a collect call from an inmate by the name of Stephen Ronan to accept these charges. Please press one. <laughs> See, that's dope, man. You got the love story in there too, you know. I mean, I really like yeah. that trailer. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, when, it was good, when, right? Yeah, no, I liked it, man. So, when did this come about? You know, the do whole documentary. I mean, who approached you? And uh, you know, I know James is a part of it too, right? A main major part. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yeah. James is the main guy. <laughs> uh, so I had got connected you know, with the social media and I had uh, reached out to somebody else that was uh, actually doing another documentary, uh, Joe Seifert with his Deadly Associates. I, mm -hmm. I got to be uh, a little bit a part of that with them. And uh, that's how I met James Forney. And uh, just everything from there just been perfect. You know, it's a great relationship, you know, and, you know, just building the story slowly, you know, a little bit at a time. And well, so that was uh Joey Seifert's film, Deadly Associates. That was based mm -hmm. on his father's uh his father was killed by the Chicago outfit, Joey Lombardo. Uh right. he was part of the Family Secrets trial. And uh this was a scene that I had played uh hitman Frank Schwaze, uh the German. Uh so I got to do a little bit of the acting and uh you know, it was a learning experience for me because I have never done anything on camera, especially acting. And, you know, I had a lot of fun doing it. You know, we did a couple scenes and, uh, you know, every every time I go out there, you know, every, you know, I get to learn new things that I haven't ever done before in my life. And uh, mm -hmm. it's just been interesting. So, James, when did you, uh, you know, like, I suppose that you kind of approach him or, you know, what's your whole play on it, man? Because this is my first time meeting you. Sure. Uh, great to meet you guys. Can hear me okay? Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm a writer, director, producer. Uh, I did produce the series Deadly Associates for Reels. Now it's up on Amazon, two hour docu series. And in the process of doing um, really stories of survivors, true crime stories, uh, I got introduced to Steve Roden and uh, we started conceiving this project, Stevie Bullets, and started doing some initial. Uh, exploratory interviews. And then we started going out, uh, you know, in the field with uh, Steve. We filmed uh, multiple seasons. We filmed uh, around Cicero and and kind of hit um, a number of places in his life story. So we would be able to go to a street corner because Steve would know what happened on that street corner and in what year and uh, actually retrace Steve's uh, whole family history all the way back to Tennessee we filmed in uh, where uh, his parents had, had moved. And so it was um, a way to, to, to give like a complete arc to the story because uh, Steve's story is about survival. It's about redemption. Um, and it's also a reflection in one man's life uh, of, you know, a powerful crime city, Cicero. Right. I mean, Chicago in itself, the whole Chicago area and the outfit is known as incubating more criminals, gangs and and corrupt politicians per square mile in just about any place in the United States. And then you take a community like Cicero and it's even a, a stronger concentration of those same uh, types of uh, behaviors and, and groups. And so Steve's story cuts through all that. It, re it represents it, but it's also very much. Uh, a personal story. And that's what made it interesting to us and my company, Octane, to develop it and turn it into um, initially a short documentary. That's what we're doing. We're going to be entering it into festivals, you know, for to gain awareness around the project. And then later, you know, we have the option of converting the story into a more fiction based on true story, you know, for a series. And Steve's story could could be 
you know, central to a grouping of stories that take place in Cicero. So that'd be cool. there. Yeah, yeah, no, that'd be because I think Steve, you were telling me a little bit about the something about doing something with Al Capone. Like, uh, was this what James is kind of talking about? No, no, no. So you know, well, yeah. I mean, Cicero's notorious because Al Capone, you know, was based there in a lot of his operations. So that's what people, you know, when you hear Cicero, that's what they, you know, first thing that comes to mind is Al Capone. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, that's you know. It had a strong influence for a long time, you know, many years ago. And, you know, like I said, I had family members that were part of it, you know, starting all the way from my grandfather. Uh, and, and I only found that out, you know, recently, probably like maybe five years ago when I started doing more research on my family background and stuff. And then I had found out, you know, some articles on my grandfather and <clears throat> I got familiar with what's called the 42 game. So, here in Chicago, the 42 gang was the predecessor for the Chicago outfit. It was uh, like their prohibition, which my grandfather was part of. And I only found that out through articles and stuff like that. I had heard stories about my uncle from my other uncles, but I never knew anything about my grandfather until I started looking up articles. I know he was implicated in, you know, some robberies and I know he had did some time. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that he uh, had a lot of money because when I was growing up, my he was already deceased, but my grandmother was living very well. She was buying cars for family members. Uh, she helped us buy our first house in Cicero. And yeah. I didn't understand where she had gotten all this money from. So I, you know, as a kid, I started asking a lot of questions and I remember her stories and stuff. And I remember a lot of the names and, you know, now of course it makes sense. So when I first learned about it was my grandmother was talking to me about how she had got money and she told me that my grandfather was part of the syndicate. You know, I didn't know whether she meant work for them or, you know, but I thought it was a church at the time because I was a young kid. And then my mother <laughs> is kind of a religion. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, yeah. It sounds like yeah. it. <laughs> so my mother, my mother, you know, she told me, oh, the syndicate is the mafia in Chicago. And she told me that my grandfather had worked for them because he had a bar on Addison Ashland uh, that he uh, owned the whole building. And uh, he would run card games. That's the way my mom described. But then I found these articles and, you know, there's a lot more to it. And my sister actually has a diamond that my grandmother had given her. And uh, she used to talk about these fur coats that my grandfather you know, hey, uh, that's what he had got in trouble for. Supposedly, they had robbed the fur coat store. And one of the guys that had told ended up coming up dead. So they had a newspaper article. I think I had sent you some of them. Yeah, yeah, I've seen uh, a few of them. But... So that's how I got yeah. familiar with it and learned about the – because a lot of people don't know about the 42 game, but the 42 game was actually – the predecessor to the Chicago outfit during Prohibition. Those were the guys. Uh, my grandfather was in an orphanage at one time, and I guess a lot of them came from that orphanage. And, oh. uh, you know, I just found it really interesting. And, uh, you know. No, I, know. I, think, so you get, I, you know? I think what you guys got, though, is, you know, really interesting. And I think, you know, you captured it, you know, you know, in the documentary, the trailer itself, you know, I mean, he's got a redemption story. You know, there's a there's a love aspect in it as well. So I think it's going to be really good when it comes out, you know, and I know, uh, you know, Stevie's talking about there might be more going on with it, you know, or maybe, you know, because you say it's finished right now, but there might be more going on with it as well and in the works, like trying to add on. Right. Well, we're finished in the filming so far uh, for this uh, iteration of it being the short doc. And now we're in, you know, the post-production phase, which is most people know as video editing. Um, and compiling the narrative. There's a lot of material. We have hours and hours of footage and, and also uh, elements that Steve's provided us and trying to construct the story in a condensed manner that people can grasp and you know, get involved in and, and still provide something that's authentic and immersive about Steve's life. Um, you know, this whole thing about the gangs as an example, you know, people outside of the life, so to speak, don't necessarily understand that there is a relationship 
between the outfit at the you know the top tier the the suits as, as some people would call them and then you know the gangs kind of the the minor leagues of uh you know the chicago outfit and and the 42s were one you know in the grand avenue area but then steve was part of the 12th street players you know you had the bishops the latin kings the gds as they were called that nobody called them the gangster <laughs> disciples if you were on the street so all of that knowledge is in the story that we're telling to say that this is how it works right yeah and that's i think always interesting uh you know for viewers to kind of get a visibility into this life you know as an example one of the things that steve uh, made a huge impression on me told me the story about was uh the story of receiving his violations you know how he was initiated into the gang and having you know the you know 10 you know guys on each side and you have to walk the gauntlet while they you know beat you with what their fists or or implements and uh you know you have to walk out standing the other side to me it sounds brutal but it's also symbolic of what his life was like that moment is like like steve's life he's had to go through the gauntlet continuously whether it was the gauntlet of of you know working you know as a gang member or dealing with his addiction or incarceration and being shot all of those things were like the violations steve's violations continued for years if you think about it that way and that's a place that many people don't come back from and steve did and yeah. to lead a productive life coming out of that i think is a story worth telling we're sharing and that's that's why we're working together to make it happen yeah, and I think it's important to, you know, put that out there that, you know, you can been been through hell and back and been shot 11 times, arrested 300 plus times. And, you know, there's still hope after after all that shit, you know, after all that time you spent in the gang, you know, there's still a way out. You know, what I mean, and, you know, his getting his story out there is definitely going to be proof of that. So I think that's a good thing that you picked up, you know, this his story, man, and really trying to get it out there now. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. So we're, yeah, we're excited yeah. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone said. Yeah. And I mean, I lost a lot of my friends too. Uh, <laughs> loss. Uh, well, so I got shot with uh, 38, uh, 25, uh, 10 millimeter in the back of the head. And uh, I believe it was a nine. So those are. And. So I had two, one gunship, two in the back of the head, one in the neck, and then the rest were like all in the stomach and a couple in the upper body and the arm. Damn. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I know you. They were pretty. You, said, you were saying that you lost a lot of friends though too, and is this one of their funerals yeah, right here? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, that was. Uh, I had bought that bouquet of flowers for my uh, one of my guys, Grizzly. Rest in peace. He was actually with me the first time that I got shot, and uh, he was he was a big guy, so I don't know, you know, they missed him, and he was right in front of me, thank God, and uh, I caught the bullet in the neck, and uh, yeah, he had died from health complications because he was a big guy, he had diabetes, but uh, he was uh, one of those loyal friends that I had, so the only way that I knew to send him off properly was with this uh, Playboy Bunny and a little card from a couple of the guys that pitched in to help buy this for him. Uh, and he, he was just one of a few, you know, uh, there were a couple of younger guys. I don't want to mention no names, but, you know, seeing that. And then one of my, I had two of my best friends that were killed. My first best friend was killed by the police in Berwyn. And that was during uh, a drug transaction gone wrong. And it, it resulted in him running. And I guess as he's running, uh, the cop shoots him in the back of the head. Never found the gun on him. And, uh, you know, it's just weighed heavily on my conscience because, you know, I feel like my actions led to his death because I had some personal issues with the same particular officer. So it was like a series of events that happened before this happened and it resulted in my friend dying. And at that time, we were both 21 years old. So this is you know, well over 20 years ago. And uh, then it was probably around 2007 when I was getting ready. To, I was incarcerated at the time uh, in the Cicero Police Department. And they gave me the news that one of my best friends had got, well, he had been shot 
and he was in the hospital. But from my understanding, he was doing good and he was going to recover. Well, things took a turn for the worse and he caught an infection and died from the gunshots and uh they came to the cell and they broke me the news and at this time i was already like on three or four felonies so i was on my way to prison and uh they came and told me that you know my friend had uh, passed away which was heartbreaking because he was one of my best friends and uh for them to tell me at that point you know i didn't know how to deal with all of it because i was facing multiple felonies and here they come with this news and you know i wasn't able to go to his wake or you know pay my last respects which was you know really <clears throat> devastating because i had already lost a friend and then that had happened and i had to finish i at that time i had a six-year sentence that i had just not even started yet but um uh, it was rough you know so during those couple years that i was in prison i was fortunate to have an aunt and an uncle that you know were supporting me and uh they used to send me a lot of literature and stuff and they wouldn't send me any money unless i had did work homework assignments which was what <laughs> planted the seed which was good because you know no, I no, it is. and at the same time you know i started reading these books that i really wasn't interested in at all but you know once you start reading stuff you know and you start doing homework it starts to absorb and it started making sense to me so i started True my change in my thinking while I was in prison, you know, because I was almost 30 at the time. And I was in my late twenties when I was uh, getting, doing my time. And I didn't have any children at the time or anything. So I had to really take a look at myself and where I was going. And uh, like I said, I started paying attention to a lot of things and in prison. And, you know, I was linking up with, you know, I would look at, you know, who the leaders were, who, you know, what they were made of. And I would watch these guys in prison and then I would get to know them. And then I would start getting respect from these guys and I could do prison. No problem. You know, I go into the joint and I can, you know, make moves, will and deal. And I started thinking about all that while I was in prison and, you know, I was going to college and I, I was thinking, you know, if I could use the same mentality, outside of jail i could be really successful my problem was addiction you know and as long as i could stay away from drugs i could keep my head straight and that's really what i did you know i got out and i played the i applied the same skills that i did when i was a criminal to being you know a normal person and i just you know we had our first child that motivated me more my wife motivated me more uh she kept me in line, you know, my wife's very hardcore with me. So, That's what you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's, she's tough, man. She's tough, but it's good because I needed that in my life. And, uh, she right. got me straight. I, uh, she helped me fix my credit. You know, I got a house, I got two cars, you know, great job, three children, you know, they go to private school. I mean, I'm, I'm doing well, you know, I, uh, I, I get a lot of respect even from the police and, uh, I still live in the same town where all that stuff had happened. And, you know, I, I was just fortunate to turn it around. Most of my friends now are lawyers, judges, and cops, you know, and, uh, <laughs> Opposite. yeah. And I don't mean that. I mean, I don't give up information. Right? I don't have no reason to, because I'm not a criminal. I have a great job. So I do everything legally. Uh, my friends that are still in that life, you know, I don't really hang out with anybody like that no more. But if I do talk to somebody, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I, my whole story, I've never limelighted anybody. I don't implicate anybody in my stories because, you know, when I started right. doing a documentary, I had a lot of, where I come from in Cicero, people, you know, they're very nervous. So they had to ask me a million questions. They wanted to see what I was doing, what I was about. James has had numerous visitors come and see him, you know, just to see what's <laughs> going on. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, things have been great. Sure. And I, I, I've, I've actually had guys, you know, uh, that actually helped me with my film and that had been through the same thing, you know, and uh, yeah. I'm just honored that, you know, they look at it like that, you know, cause you know, they respect me, you know, and uh, they just been helping me throughout the whole thing. And things have been going great, you know? Yeah. And these documentaries, uh, I, I don't get to oh, go ahead. I've done. Yeah, no. And then I've done multiple my podcasts with people all over the yeah. country from, mm -hmm. from you to uh, I've connected with Ron strong uh, uh julio amanza who's got a gym he's from chicago he was in the gangs here and uh with the cartels and 
he's changed since he's got to a gym in Arizona, uh, in Florida, Cyril DePaggio, Mob King, yeah. you know, he's another guy that's been through the system and turned it around and started doing film. Uh, New York, I did my first stacks, of course. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and then the first podcast that I did with uh, James was uh, with Nick Christopher's out of New York. Yeah. So these were guys that were uh, gangsters from New York, like real, you know, outfit. Uh, well, they call it the mafia in uh, New York and Chicago. We yeah. call it the outfit, <laughs> you know. And it's just I've learned a lot through that, you know. I've learned a lot, yeah. you know, through all these podcasts and stuff. And it's all pretty much the same. Everybody's, you know, got a little bit of history, you know, some more than others and stuff. But, you know. I was, like I said, I was fortunate enough to turn it around and uh, go a whole different direction, you know. And oh, I don't right. do like motivational spe speeches <laughs> or anything like that. But, yeah, you know, you I just try to show my yeah. kids the right way. Yeah, I, yeah, I could. I mean, um, I, I am a speaker uh, for the Teamsters yeah. uh, 703. I represent them, you know, very hardcore. So that's what I'm doing, you know, for my job and stuff. You know, I help my fellow employees, you know, try to get the best of everything. And, uh, you know, I try to be a leader in that aspect, you know. And, uh, and, and I always have, you know, my doors open to people that are trying to change their life. Because I, I, I just spoke to somebody recently that uh, her son was going through a horrible addiction with heroin. And uh, I had showed her a different trailer that I didn't give you. And it's uh, very in depth about, you know, my story, you know, and about yeah. my drug addiction and stuff. And uh, yeah. it was good for her to see that, you know, because, you yeah. know, there there was a lot of horrible things that I had went through uh, while I was on drugs. And, you know, like, like James said, most people never come back from that because my mind was so deep into that world. And then I when I had got locked up, like I said, I was a, like a... Uh, I would see these, you know, gang members, the chiefs, you know, whoever was running it, and I would just focus in on them. And I'd see the way they would move and how they carried themselves. And that was what was enticing to me. And, uh, you know, I'm just yeah. lucky that I got out of that mind frame because I knew something was wrong because I had did a year in SAG while I was in Cook County. And uh, I started reading, like, true crime, you know, and I just was like, infatuated with it i had a, it wasn't my wife at the time it was a another girl that i was dating and she would send me these serial killer books and fbi profile books because i was in segregation so i was in a uh, cell by myself for 23 and one for almost a year and yeah. when i started reading these true crime books you know my mind just started you know it was going in a bad direction <laughs> put it that way and i yeah, had to no. really yeah and i had <laughs> I had to really take a look at myself because I was thinking, you know, if this is the way my thinking is, you know, right. some, something's not right. And luckily yeah. I had an aunt and uncle that were, uh, you know, they were involved with the church and stuff and they seen some hope in me and I'm lucky, you know, because my uncle, like I said, uh, he had got in trouble while he was in college selling cocaine and uh, he, uh, he turned it around and he became a billionaire. And uh, he does like, yeah, and he, he, he does, he did, he's retired now and he lives on a golf course in uh, <laughs> South Carolina. So he's living a good life, but he was one of my guys that stood behind me with my aunt and uh, they would send me all kinds of motivational books, which was good for me because I changed the reading and yeah. when I started reading these books. Yeah. And then of course, like once I had children and stuff, you know, I had to, you know, I had to figure out who I was and what I wanted to be. And when I started doing the podcast, I don't like to get on podcasts and brag about my past and say that I was this gangster and that I was doing all these horrible things. Uh, I try to, you know, send a positive message. You know, I don't want to be mm -hmm. one of those people that get on here and talk stupid and say did this and that, you know, because it's not about that. You know, no, I know what you mean. I'm like that's looking. what I was doing with mine, with uh, you know, my documentary series that I made about the, you know, the American mafia. I, I haven't released it yet, you know, but it's my first one that I've done, and I know what you mean. Like at the end of each episode, I was like, you know, I, I I go on for like a minute, and I'm like, you know, this ain't the life you want. You know, all this. I mean, listen to all the shit I just talked about. 
you know, but, you know, I'll, I'll show you this trailer and I'll, I'll play your trailer before we end out. But is there any final thoughts you want to add into it? Because like I said, we were just going to do a little short live or whatever today. Yeah, I, I think I'm just going to play off of what Steve said, which is, look, yeah, there is an audience for any form of true crime because there's a fascination, even that you could call a morbid curiosity with the life. But there's another side, of, which is what Steve was talking about. Stories can heal. Stories can inspire. Stories can redirect your thinking about what, you know, the life is. And that's that's important. you got to show one thing to show the authenticity to understand this really happened, but then show that you can make other choices in your life. And that's a valuable message to a lot of people. And we'll still satisfy those that need to have the curiosity about the life. Right. So we're hoping to have both audiences as we put the story together. Yeah. There is. Well, uh, what I'll do is I'll play, you know, my trailer for you guys and then I'll play yours again and then we'll just end it out there. But thank you. Yeah. yeah. Let's check it out. Very twisted. You never know when it's your time to go. This life is very twisted. You never know when it's your time to go. One day you're putting in work with someone and the next day they're taking you out. In our days, it was very quiet, you know, nobody ever talked about this, you know, nobody glamorized it. It was all like hush hush. Not a glamorous life. And again, it's not what you see in Goodfellas. It's not what you see in Casino. Some days you were dead broke. Some days you had two grand in your pocket. It wasn't every day. You know, you don't know anything else. You don't know what it is to go wake up six o'clock and go to work. Work? What the fuck is that? I wasn't going to work. Even bosses get murdered in this life. There was younger guys underneath him, and he wasn't doing the right thing, I guess. He was coming out of the card game, and unfortunately, uh, a lone gunman came up and shot him five times. People who knew me will tell you, I like to use a bat a lot. If I had to shoot you, I'd shoot you too. I've done that. This life requires many mixed personalities. You have to wear many hats in this life to try and survive. You become four or five different people all at once, and... You gotta go home and be a dad and a husband. You gotta go to work and do your job. You gotta be out in the street and be a gangster. The Bonanno family is called the Bonanno family because of my grandfather, Joe Bonanno. That life there is done. Uh, today you have to be legitimate yeah, today. Man. But you're gonna be an idiot to wanna right. be a hooligan today. Because Jail time's now like 100 years for doing right. nothing. Yeah, you, you'll be dead in prison for life or in the witness protection program. I don't know anybody. Now, when the Mafia turned their back on me, I know everybody. There was the big flip of the Gambino underboss, Sammy the Bull Gravano. Here he is, signing autographs in a restaurant on Mulberry Street. It was supposed to be a secret organization. He was a very, very, very violent guy, no question about it. Albert Anastasia, he was a Brooklyn guy. He was probably the biggest killer in the history of the mob. Michael Francis, his father, Sonny, uh, was a really tough guy, but he really raised his son right. Son, if you want to see a gangster, that's Sonny Francis. And John Cena, you don't compliment anybody. This is a documentary series about the American Mafia. It includes 11 different crime families. Each episode is about a different one. The crime families include the Gambino, Genovese, Bonanno, Colombo, Lucchese, the Gallo Crew, Chicago Outfit, the Philadelphia Mafia, the Patriarca, the Traficante Crime Family, and the Jewish Mafia. Please subscribe to my channel to watch each episode as they come out. <laughs> That's a lot of work. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. Man, yeah, it, it was good. It was. It's uh, my first documentary series, man, or doing anything in that kind of way, but I did 11 episodes and fuck, it took a long wow. time. <laughs> That's good, though. But, <laughs> oh, thank you, man. Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll play uh, your guys' trailer and then I'll end it out there for you. Thanks, guys. So I know you guys got other shit going on today. When I got involved, it was around uh, 1992, 1993. Kicking, punching, hitting, anything goes. That was how you got into our gang back then. That's the farm league for the Chicago outfit. I'd be doing most of the work in Cicero. I was a shooter. I was involved with uh, PCP, crack, heroin. Some people are known to survive through gunshots uh, through the heightened state of PCP. My nickname is Stevie Bullets. 
I just remember the burning, and I remember in the ambulance looking out the back of the window and just thinking, like, that was probably going to be it for me. Usually you don't cooperate with the police. What happens in the street stays in the streets. Two thousand and six. I just got released from Vandalia Prison and I went straight to the bar. I just was going there for a Halloween party, straight from prison, right off the prison bus. They had an outfit waiting for me in the parking lot. It was a Miami Vice cop. And I was in pink and white. And I met Steve that night. He was a very pasty white vampire. <laughs> he was okay. I didn't really think he was my type at the time. But I mean, he was very nice. We were talking for a little bit and then he disappeared. And I'm like, okay, where'd you go? <laughs> Come to find out he had to be home at midnight because he just got off the bus from prison. And I had no idea. Well, Lucia's family was in law enforcement, so I didn't mix too well at first. He was a bad boy and I wasn't supposed to be with a bad boy. I knew like right away that that's who I wanted to be with. I mean, he told me he loved me within a week. Told me he was gonna be with me for the rest of his life. About a month later, we were inseparable. I mean, we had our moments. He, he's like a volcano, I'm like an earthquake, and we go at it, but we were always together. And then I ended up catching a serious time and felony, and I ended up getting six year sentence. There was no conversation, he was gone. I thought our relationship was over until I started receiving all the letters I just pursued her from jail. I pretty much started writing her one, two times a day, every single day for two and a half years. Please stick out this sentence with me. I love you, I wanna be with you. And he wrote me every day for a year. I felt loved. You have a collect call from an inmate by the name of Stephen Ronan to accept these charges. Please press one. Yeah, that's going to be a good one. So everyone, you know, be on the lookout for that. You know, uh, Steve and James have been, you know, working on it for a long time. So, you know, it's going to be good when it comes out. Any any idea on release dates yet? Well, we're, uh, you know, we're targeting the Chicago Film Festival submission date, and that's, uh, you know, in, in the later spring. So that's when we'd want to get it uh, uh, put out. There's a, a number of different... Uh, you know, short documentary and uh, nonfiction film festivals uh, in the U.S., Canada, around the world. So we're going to, you know, obviously try on the home turf and then we're going beyond that to beyond the other borders. So that's our goal. We'll get it out. OK, well, everybody be on the lookout for that. James and Steve, Thank I you. appreciate you guys coming on, man. Thank you, man. Thanks for, Thank thanks you, for having James. us. All right. Thank you, Stevie. See you All guys. Right. See you. All right, guys. Bye. Take care.